Welcome to The Climb. This is a show dedicated to singers, songwriters, and indie artists like you. We want to help you create leverage in the music business. If you haven't figured it out yet, The Climb is literally an acronym that stands for Creating Leverage in the Music Business. Let me introduce you to my co-host, Brent Baxter. Brent is a, an award-winning hit songwriter with cuts by Alan Jackson, Randy Travis, Lady Annabellum, Joe Nichols, and more. And what I love most about him is he helps songwriters turn pro by teaching the art, craft, and business of songwriting. And you can find Brent at songwritingpro.com or manversusrow.com if you're old school. If you're old school, mm-hmm. manvsrow.com. And I'd like to introduce you to my co-host, Johnny Dwinell. Johnny owns Daredevil Production. It's an innovative artist development company. They help you find your sound, and they help you find your audience. Not only do they develop and improve your artistry, they also grow and monetize your fan base, creating what? Fingers. Cash flow. Cash flow. Cash flow. Daredevil has worked with multi-platinum artists like Colin Ray, Tracy Lawrence, Ty Herndon, and Andy Griggs, just to name a few. You can find Johnny at daredevilproduction.com. That's production, singular, no S up in here. Hey, Johnny. How's it going, man? I'm doing great, dude. How you doing? I'm doing well. I'm laid Good, back. Man. Got my mind laid on my... Back. Never, never mind. I don't have any money. Never mind. <laughs> never mind what That's my all. mind is on. Never mind. That's all I got. That's all I got. <laughs> There's an insight into the male psyche. <laughs> got my mind on my... Here's what my mind is on. Wait. Bills. No, I don't want that. Never mind. <laughs> I got it. I got it. I got it. I ain't got it. I got it. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Well, man, you got a lot of stuff going on, huh? Well, trying to, trying to, yeah. Here and, uh, well, by the time you, everyone to hear this, I'll already be done with it. But yeah, for me, tomorrow morning, I go teach at NSAI. I'm the featured teacher at the uh, NSAI song camp this year. For the whole so, weekend, right? Full weekend, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. That's so awesome. if you're still listening, maybe you, uh, if you are listening because you met me this coming weekend, awesome. Thank you. You were wonderful. And uh, yeah, and if you missed it, Sign up for next year. Maybe they'll have me back. I don't know. They might be sick. Right. And, and and it's too early to tell any names or to make any details. But Brent and I uh, have been asked to join in on another little kind of boot camp kind of a thing, mm-hmm. where you can get in the proximity of some people who really are in the industry making it happen. And um, when that develops and it comes to fruition, believe me, you're going to be the first to know. But uh, we're going to have a couple more opportunities out there for you too, just to get in and, and, and learn some more, which is cool. Yeah. So, uh, I want to talk about organic. Mm, I, you know, we've gone gluten free. We've gone uh, non GMO as much as possible. Uh-huh. Uh, we're trying to go non DOJ uh, <laughs> as a songwriter. So we can get paid. <laughs> and uh, that's why I don't have my mind on anything because I got my mind on my DOJ. On your DOJ. And uh, uh, we'll probably get that into there. That's so. Department of Justice for those of you who haven't figured that right. out yet. Some bad rulings that came down that basically say songwriters are crap and aren't worth a damn. We're not going to pay them anything. Exactly, but. and uh, Google has more money, so they win. But, um, yeah, but that's not what we're talking about tonight. We're talking about the other kind of organic, right? I assume we're not talking about food. Yeah, I, mean, I think – I mean I, I talk to so many artists, Brent, that are um, – they pride themselves on being, quotation marks – Organic. I'm organic. Mm. Everything happens to me like it, it sort of naturally, right? Mm-hmm. And there's no – as if there's no intention. Um, and that is uh, – there's a, I think it's 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 mis I think it's misinterpreted. I think you're probably, it's, it's misinterpreted. You're probably not talking to these artists backstage at their huge show at the stadium. No. Probably no, not. No. no. That, that's point number one. <laughs> okay. Just check. These people are not looking down the ladder. <laughs> They're looking up the ladder right. going, I'm completely organic and everything should happen. And I listen, to be honest, I get this because I feel like the 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 narrative that comes from a lot of artists back in the day, their favorite iconic artists, right, back in the seventies and the sixties, who just had this record label that came in and made everything magically happen in the land where all that magically happened, right. uh, and their experience 
is that it really was organic. <laughs> so <laughs> like, I'm not putting down these artists, right. you know, but like, you know, some artists out there that uh, I won't name any names, but they're out there like, you know, good music always finds its audience. And it's like, no, no. Like you found your record label and your record label found your it's, audience. It's a little you know? bit of survivorship bias because we only hear about from the winners. Good right? point. Good point. That's a real. I wrote a whole lengthy blog on that way back in the day, and I love that survivorship. But we have to make sure that that's good. But what what is organic? I mean, uh, here's a quote. Here's a quote. Nothing attracts a crowd like a crowd. P. T. Mm. Barnum. He understood marketing. Okay. Um, just think about it on the schoolyard, man. Fourth grade, you walk out. Fifth grade, elementary school, you're out there, and there's a whole crowd of people. What's going on? Mm-hmm. Fight. Fight. <laughs> Where are you? Or two guys about to fight, and then somebody yeah. yelling, throw a punch! Throw a punch! Yeah. Do it, do it, do get it. him! I got you. Right. And, then, and, then, and then what happens? You're over there. You're watching. Oh, yeah. <laughs> No matter how smart you are, no matter how above that you are, whether you're into fighting or not fighting, you want to see what it looks like, you know? Yeah. How about um, driving down the road and you're in a traffic jam for 45 minutes and you come up on a car accident mm-hmm. and there's, you know, there's a crowd of police and fire trucks and what are you trying to do? It's your turn to blow past now mm-hmm. and move on your way, but don't. You're going to get a good look at it because nothing attracts a crowd like a crowd. It's how we're wired up. So understanding this from a marketing perspective, and there's there's organic misconceptions about writing too, which we're, which, um, you know, we're going to broach on here. But don't misinterpret that because uh, a lot of people erroneously feel that because you just magically heard it on the radio, it was ready to go, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? That you don't understand what went on with the, the 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 pains that we've gone through and the work that we've done, say with an artist like Bailey James, in first of all conceptualizing the record, mm-hmm. right? From from the lyrics, the melodies, and the chords that are going to support those melodies to be consonant with her as an artist. Mm-hmm. Okay, now some of y'all are are farther along on your journey than that. You have your artistry, but then there's still the image that comes in, like I work with another company that's aside from me called A and R. The gentleman named Jeff Teague is brilliant at what he does. He used to one run Word Records. He used to run Word Publishing. Uh, this dude's been in the industry forever. I mean, he's got gold records on his wall from Kenny Rogers, and we talk incessantly about imaging. And it's his job because you know what? I don't have the time <laughs> on my plate to handle that. I'm too busy thinking up content, putting out, you know, finding different ways to market. But he's got to make everything work. He's got to make sure when you look at that picture, it makes sense when you hear the music mm-hmm. and it makes sense when you see the the it, it's all consonant. Right. This it kind of is this you organic? Look like the record sounds like. Right. I mean, you know, uh, uh, Guns and Roses uh, couldn't look like they look and sound like Celine Dion. We wouldn't understand it. <laughs> right. And, and vice versa, Celine Dion. Now, after Celine Dion's a big hit, if she comes out looking like Guns N' Roses, it's cute and adorable. Right. But if you're trying to break Celine Dion, she doesn't she doesn't come out looking like a gutter rat, right? You know? uh, it, it, because her voice is that's not what she's selling. That's not who she is. That's that's she's not addicted to heroin. So, you know, <laughs> so you're saying the candy wrapper needs to let you know that what type of candy is inside. Right. That's right. Brochure has got to be the same as the wrap. Right. You don't want broccoli on the on the container and then Kit Kats inside or Kit Kats on the wrapper, but then you open it up and there's like cauliflower. That just That's confuses right. people. This is all part of the me dis dis demystifying the the preconception of what organic is. Okay. Mm-hmm. Would it surprise you if I told you that Elvis we all know if you you know if you know a little bit about Elvis, the uh, Colonel Parker was his manager. Mm-hmm. Okay, Colonel Parker he's, was a circus huckster. And before he got into fried chicken, right? Before he got into the music industry, he was a he was a carny. Mm-hmm. He was out there barking and had an affinity for luring bystanders into the tent. Mm-hmm. Doesn't that make sense? I remember when I was a kid, I went to my first, and it was Barnum and Bailey Circus. I'm from Delavan, Wisconsin, where Barnum and Bailey Circus was born, not for nothing, at the bottom of Delavan Lake that I did <laughs> grow up on. There is still an elephant that broke through the ice and drowned um, on the lake. And that's a big, like, diving thing or whatever, you know. But, um, they, they, they. I, I remember, you know, being drawn in. It's like this. She's, she's a snake. She's wrapped around. Blah, blah, blah. He's barking. I'm looking at this lady that I'm thinking it's a snake, and it's just this lady that's like bent all weird. And I remember looking <laughs> down the glass case, and I'm like, crap. Like, <laughs> I just got had. You know. 
But imagine Colonel Parker with that skill set to get a guy like me in there, who's like a little on the skeptical side. Mm-hmm. He did this good. This guy did such a good job, you know, get me in. And then who's in the tent? It's Elvis. <laughs> Ooh, OK, different story now, right. different story now. And I have used that, you know, in the electronics industry. We did that uh, brief in less than 30 seconds. Um, I, I worked with a company that uh, had, had this walk on water technology for soldering and desoldering circuit boards with zero damage, which is a big deal for prototype boards. Right. If you look at your iPhone, the first five boards of that iPhone that they ever made were freaking expensive. <laughs> Okay, and then when they make a million of them at a time, the cost goes way down. But while they're debugging it and they're figuring everything out, those are expensive. And so to ruin it because of heat, mm-hmm. right? Instead of a design error, is costly that that can be avoided. So there, so we have this walk on water technology. I'm doing these shows and these trade shows, and I got uh, you know doctorates of electronics, four deep propeller heads, standing in line with, like a circus huckster waiting to see what I'm going to do. And you know what? They're super intelligent. They're skeptical and they're pissed at me by the time they get up there. They're pissed. They're like, I can't believe it. And then I show them what we do and they're like, it's Elvis. <laughs> it was the electronic version of Elvis. And they're like, oh my God. And I can't tell you, Brent, how many times I would go into these meetings and these people would be like, I wanted to hate you mm-hmm. because I could. you made me stay in line. I Oh, and then when you got up, though, it was worth it. Mm-hmm. It was so good, you know. So so I, I want to talk about, you know, too many artists think that the image, the artistic lane of an artist the in, in their performances uh, of their most beloved iconic artist, the one that made them want to be an artist was somehow organically or magically put together as if the artists just were born polished and ready to go mm-hmm. and waiting for um, just w- waiting for that audience to find them. I mean, if, what is organic mean to you exactly? If you're listening to this podcast, you know, uh, it, it, it is, it doesn't mean that it happens naturally without any preconception or outside guidance, then you're wrong. Mm-hmm. You're categorically wrong by all of your artistic icons. And I want to handle, we just talked about Elvis, Mm -hmm. right? And we saw about how much Elvis leaned on and listened to the Colonel. Mm -hmm. And that got him a lot of good things, got him a lot of bad things. (laughs) They they did too many movies. Mm -hmm. And and, uh, he was a little bit too much of business there and not uh, not enough on that but still he's still elvis he's still the king right he's he he got lots of mistakes on his record he was not perfect but man when he was good when he was on he was the king yeah he's for a reason okay but let's talk about struck out more than anyone else right but good the home run king And so, I, you know, I think like writing that you hear a lot about that too, right? Would you say that that's the case? Like, like people that are just like, man, I just want to write what comes to me and we're just going to let it roll from there. And to a degree, you want to do that. But to a degree, like when you talked about crickets, mm-hmm. when you talked about, you've talked about different songs that you've dissected already where you went in and had a vision and it took some discipline and some intention, mm-hmm. which would be, I guess, I, you know, in the misguided world, considered the opposite of being organic, right? Right. Yeah, I've, I've had uh, recently a, a reader because uh, I every once in a while turn take a reader question, turn it into a blog post over at songwritingpro.com. And somebody had asked me, they shot me an email saying, "Hey, did you when you were starting out, or do you always write just for profit, or like when you started out, did you write just out of passion, and then the profit just kind of naturally flowed out of that?" It did not naturally flow out of that. It was, uh, you know, I write for profit so I can write more songs. You know, so that's why I want to I want to profit from my songs because it buys me more songwriting time because that's what I love to do. So yeah, it's intentional. I mean, I there have been cuts that have, you know, you say maybe happen naturally, but on the writing end, you're on purpose trying to write something that's going to work for the market. And then you try to get them out there and you put them in a form where people can accept it and hear it and it makes sense and it's a good demonstration. And you try to get them disseminated to the people that can say yes. So, you know, is that organic? Is it not? I mean, there's especially songs that are on the charts, man. It, it's even if it was written in the room with kind of no preconceived notions, the machine kicks in, you yeah. know, who the publishers are, who the writers are, who the artist is, did the artist write it? And all and the as market- a pro songwriter, you can't help but those factors come into play. Oh yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, because, you know, people have pieces of the pie and that sort of thing. And, yeah, it didn't just happen. You know, there's a lot of people kind of pushing their agendas that go into it a lot of times, it feels like. So it's not necessarily just, oh, yeah, we happened across a song, somehow ran across it, and we thought it was great. And now it's on the record. That's what happens on TV and movies, but not as much what happens in – on music in real life. See, I think I think to a degree on uh, your, your, the definition of organic changes once you become pro, and uh, in, in on the amateur level, it, uh, I think that a lot of people use it as an excuse not to do more work. Yeah, and I think that's, it means they don't have to think about it too much. Yeah, and I think that's an important distinction. What you said is organic changes once you turn pro, because the pro that wants a sustained career is going to operate in such a way that that is kind of natural and how they build it. It's a habit. It's how they naturally operate now. So I guess if it's how they naturally do it, that's, I guess you could consider that. They organic. naturally do it with awareness of the industry. Right. right. They naturally operate in a way that's business savvy or they have people yeah. on their team that do that for them. Whereas, yeah. you know, we talked before about stages of a rocket, <laughs> you know, the, yeah. the purely organic thing, it may help you get some attention, but if you're going to take that next step, you want to have more intentionality and go by certain steps, I guess. Yeah, man. And I think, I mean, like, like, let's break this down some more. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm probably going to disturb some people with some of this information. Okay. But let's. Well, you disturbed the, me once you talked about the lady, the lizard lady that was all been out of shape. I've already disturbed <laughs> ever since then. See, those are your own fears coming into your play. <laughs> I, I just triggered it. I didn't have anything to do with creating. <laughs> but um, so, you know, the Beatles are, I, I mean, 600 million units sold. There's not an artist that has ever outsold the Beatles. Um, I don't think there's an artist that's close. I don't think there's an artist that's done. Is, is there an artist that's done a third of that that you're aware of? I don't know. I know Garth. Um, you know, in the maybe US. maybe Elvis. Maybe Elvis. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, so. I know at least in the U.S. it's like Garth and the Beatles and Elvis, and sure. I don't know. Where. But I don't. Has Garth gotten anywhere near 600 million? No, units? no, probably not worldwide. Uh, maybe just. In- yeah, I'm talking about worldwide. Yeah. But so okay. Brian Epstein, manager of the Beatles, parents own a siding company. That's where he came up with. He had a little side passion for music, so they also own a record uh, record store. Hmm. That's how the Beatles came into his awareness. Mm-hmm. They put out this little 45, so a bunch of girls like like the Beatles, and it came in, and he's like, oh, who are these? oh, my gosh, this is great. Now, keep in mind, this is after you know years in eight hour, seven days a week, eight hours a day in Hamburg, Right, like crushing it. Yeah, like this eight hour after, sets. They were just, yes. This is hard work, right? Where they're where they're working through artistically the art and the craft of songwriting, okay, mm-hmm. and uh, and how to perform and how to uh, be professional, right? What a sound check means instead of screwing around. You know, mm-hmm. you watch a Nashville sound check; it goes by fast, it goes by quick. Everybody gets their stuff done. You go watch an amateur band sound check, and it's a circus. You know. <laughs> yeah. It's terrible. It's it's annoying, and um, <clears throat> but they they also had at this point by the time they came into Epstein's awareness had written uh, depending on which interview you choose somewhere between fifty and a hundred and fifty songs mm-hmm. that admittedly John and Paul will tell you were shite. <laughs> yeah. Okay. They were terrible to get to that sort of groove that they got where they just knew the infectious melody, they knew the lyrics, they knew what they were trying to get to, and then, man, and that was I want to hold your hand moment, mm-hmm. right? Then we got to, we grew artistically to uh, let be, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and 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 these kinds, of, these kinds of artistic pieces of work. But here's my point. Epstein, uh, you know, got the band... Uh, started to work with them and two things happened. Number one, he had a vision. Number two, the band let him do it, mm-hmm. which is important because that almost never happens. Right? right. Like, and he came in and said, you know, they were scruffy at the time. This is the sixties is a hippie era. You know, I think that John probably looked a lot more like John looked in 1970 and mm-hmm. 1962. Right. And, and Epstein came in and said, no, we need to clean it up a little bit. I want everybody to be clean shaven. You know, yes, they all had long hair at the time, for which was you know considered unreasonable right mm-hmm. like like there were crazy dirt bags for having the hair but it was all trimmed 
and it was styled and it was clean. Like Mm -hmm. there wasn't, it wasn't frazzled or anything like that. Okay. And he, he got them to do that. He then put them into the famous black suits with the black ties and the white shirts Mm -hmm. and had them bow after every song together and thank the audience and turn them into image wise. What was a very, I can take this dirt bag home to mom. (laughs) (laughs) Kind of thing. I mean, it was brilliant. Now, uh, this is not organic. This is thought out. This is intentional. Mm -hmm. This is like, hey, this is like understanding there's nobody doing this in the marketplace. Let's do this over here. We've got this killer music. I need to get it to a bunch of people and make it as socially acceptable as possible, right? Or at least as shareable as possible, whatever that meant in 1962 or 63 Mm -hmm. when he started working with them. But then he also knew of 11 other record stores in his immediate sort of area, okay, Um, you know, in and around uh, Liverpool, London, whatever. I'm not – don't bust my balls in the um, geography of it all. Hmm. But within a certain range, he knew of 11 record stores that reported to the charts. Mm -hmm. And he would send girls out with his money. To go buy records from those 11 record stores so that they would report to the charts and the Beatles would chart. Mm. Did they get a number one artificially? No. Did they chart sort of artificially? Yes. Mm -hmm. What did that create? That created a little bit of momentum, a little bit of fire. Everybody looking. There's that little crowd, right? Mm -hmm. Nothing attracts a crowd like a crowd. They're looking over there. Oh, what's this? Oh, it's the, oh my God, but the song was great. Right. Right. Yeah. Just like Elvis, like just like the Colonel Huckster in you into the tent. Mm-hmm. And then what do you see? It's freaking Elvis. Elvis. Right. And you're like, oh, yeah, this is awesome. OK, mm-hmm. I might feel like an idiot for walking through this door. But as soon as I got in, I turn around and shake the man's hand like this right. is great. And so this was um, this was all put together. This is exactly what Epstein wanted. And the Beatles let them have it. OK. And, you know, a lot of people think that organic means that the Beatles might have come out with um you know, that first 45 and then a girl bought it and told her friend and then they each told two friends and then they each took two friends and they each told two friends and then everybody – and that that's not the way it happens. Mm-hmm. People got their own lives. They're busy. Right. OK? They need to hear about it again and again and again and again, which is why the chart hustle worked for Epstein. Mm-hmm. OK? So – Now, here's some – So ahead. I just kind of wrap my head around the kind of the different angles, I guess, on organic. Ultimately – it's kind of like, well, whatever happens, happens. I do my thing and whatever happened, happens. But as yeah. far as branding and marketing, not necessarily because Epstein, he was working. He had a vision and he put them together a certain way. But then also as far as like gaining fans and moving songs up the charts, that was with a plan too. That wasn't just, well, if they like my record, they'll play it. So I'm just going to send it to the late, you know, to the record stores and if they people buy it they buy it and if radio likes it they'll play it whatever happens happens it's not that's right and how about this from a songwriting perspective if my song is good they're gonna love it right and they're gonna take it at this publishing company because it's good no so so you're right about that so did brian epstein single-handedly create 600 million records sold in Beatlemania? No. There was a point of critical mass where it took off, but was he extremely responsible, and the Beatles, for playing in the sandbox with him, Mm -hmm. for creating the sort of, let's call it the underground critical mass, those first thousand superfans that turned into 5,000 superfans, that turned into 10,000 superfans, that turned into such a big crowd, and nothing attracts a crowd like a crowd, Mm -hmm. that it just became undeniable and then, of course, it was so good that everybody that came to look at the fight was like, oh, it's the best fight this ever. Is fantastic. The best fight ever. Right. This is fantastic. You know, this is this is the most amazing thing I've ever seen. So that's that's what you're trying to do with marketing, you're trying to create a reason for people to get excited. And initially, you got to rub the sticks together to create that little spark. Mm-hmm. You know, in that you ever seen anybody start a fire as a caveman, mm-hmm. right? Like without a big lighter. There's a whole lot of work that started with a little bit of, you know, fliffy, <laughs> burny stuff, right? Yeah. Like that That's a leaves. Term. And, yes. Yeah, that that turns that all of a sudden turns into the freaking 
bonfire, right. you know, that's amazing. And then the bonfire turns into the forest fire, right. which is what you're trying to create. But it starts with the spark. And the smart, the spark isn't the music. The spark is the marketing. The music is the fuel. Mm-hmm. The music is what keeps it going. The good song, the good. So I, I've heard uh, it said, if, if I can interject here, that yeah, good marketing makes a bad product fail faster. Yes. Because if the Beatles had stunk and he's sending girls out with his own money and all this stuff trying to get some chart position. So more people hear it earlier and it's not ready and it's bad. People are going to go, this is not good. It's terrible. And more people (laughs) will find that out more quickly through good marketing. But the Beatles are the Beatles. So it was, they, it was they were ready. So, they had their 10,000 hours. Right. Yeah. So more people heard it faster and went, oh, I love it. Oh, I think it's great. Yeah, I was wrong. Right. Right? Yeah. And then, of course, they were so popular in England that they were able to waltz right over across the, the, the sea, right over across the pond here and hop right onto the Ed Sullivan show, which was the biggest, hottest show at the time. Only three networks at the time. And I think God knows, you know, at least 200 million people in this country at that point. Um, and boom, they became the instant sensation. But all that was predicated they wouldn't have done that through a connection right. and no momentum in england mm-hmm. through the right phone number right you know through the right i had a guy email me today like i'm having problems johnny with uh with uh finding a record deal so why don't you just forward me some of your record contract contacts first email i don't even know the guy i'm like <laughs> but my label contacts you want like what are they gonna do yeah <laughs> what do you have you know what that's on? called that's called being an ask hole yeah right there right. just exactly. Right, right out, right out the gate. Just stick your tongue That's in my mouth, it. man. Thanks. So, so, uh, just to put a a bow around this, I'm really gonna blow your mind. Now. Okay. So, Stones, Rolling Stones, mm-hmm. their first manager for the first um, I don't know how many years, maybe four to six years of the first, of the Rolling Stones when they first came out, uh, which was shortly after the Beatles, mm-hmm. right? Their manager's name was Andrew Lug Oldham, mm-hmm. and. Uh, Guess where Andrew Luke Oldham started out? Oh, uh, let's see. I read the notes. I'm not going to say. I'm not a <laughs> he worked for Epstein. <laughs> he was Epstein's assistant. He helped organize all that stuff that created the Beatles. So mm-hmm. he did the exact same thing with the Stones, but the packaging was different. Mm-hmm. He's like, we got the Beatles. They're clean cut. They're people you can take home to mom. You're the Stones. I need you to be dangerous. Right. I don't want you to cut your hair. I want you guys to wear leather and look like drug addicts. You know, like I want you to be dangerous. I want you to be the, you know, the the forbidden fruit. <laughs> right. <laughs> and and the same thing with the same eleven record stores. Mm-hmm. With another band that had a lot of talent, but he figured out another way to sort of move the needle at the beginning just to get that initial little spark. Mm-hmm. That turned into that little bo- that turned into that little campfire mm-hmm. that turned into a bonfire that then turned into a forest fire that became the Rolling Stones. Again, not organic. This was intelligent, intelligent, intentional moves to get people on board with with what's happening. Wham! Another example: George Michael. Wham! But you know, most people don't know this. George Michael, when he went solo, was already a superstar because Wham has sold 25 million units worldwide. But he, when he did not, go solo, he did leave me hanging on like a yo-yo. Oh, isn't that the line? That was where you go was solo. Was, I don't want to talk about yo-yos and Wham and Andrew Ridgely and what the okay, hell was going on in that camp. <laughs> <laughs> That's none of my business. <laughs> but uh, they, they listen, they couldn't buy America. They couldn't get in. They were selling like crazy in Europe, but they, America did not care. Mm-hmm. Did not care. And then they figured out some way to get to China. The, one of the first bands, European, Western bands, to come in full on into China. They figured out how to do it. They assembled that whole thing. All the press was there. And because that was such big news Mm -hmm. that by the time they got out of China, they were already stars in America and they were well received. Hmm. Right now, not too different. If you think about it from the Beatles doing everything that they did in Europe first, Mm -hmm. 
and then coming over to the just waltzing right into the Ed Sullivan show. So in America, right, we're so enamored with the Beatles. You might be able to make an argument. I'm pulling this out of my butt, but you might be able to make an argument if you interviewed a thousand Beatles fans from America and a thousand Beatles fans from Europe, the perspectives might be completely different, mm. right? Because America, they just were on TV once and then that, that it was the show that everybody watched. Right. <laughs> And that was awesome. Mm-hmm. But in, in, in England, it might have been why well, I saw them at a club, mate, you know, right. and, and I watched them when they came up and, and and they saw a little bit more of the ascent when it was all packaged up, all ready to go. Mm-hmm. Everything was put together or they saw them in Hamburg, right? Right. Or, with the original <laughs> drummer before Ringo. Yeah. Came in on. the formative yeah. years. Yeah. And then they came up, but we saw them and it was all ready to go. And it was the perfect rocket launch, mm-hmm. you know, everything there. Think about that. So, so that, that brings us just to the end of, of what do you consider? Consider to be organic. I mean, guys, th- this does not happen naturally. You're not going to put out a hit song. You could put out a hit song. You could put out Cruise, right, from mm-hmm. Florida Georgia Line, which is undeniably a knockdown, drag out, smash hit song, mm-hmm. and put it on uh, YouTube, and nobody's going to care. Right. Because they don't know about it. Mm-hmm. You've got to flan the flames and you've got to make sure you're budgeting for that, right? right. Have some money to do that. Have some, if you, if you're writing good songs, by golly, then do it. Writing but good also, songs makes it easier. That's Plus, right. And you but, have to spend less money, but you still gotta, you gotta work the steps. You gotta get the business side of it. That's right. And, 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 and starting again from like, you know, writing songs, like some of those songs, as a songwriter myself, I've had some that just sort of came to me in five or ten minutes. They're better. Those are the, but I probably took a couple hundred songs to earn that right. little gift from the muse or yeah. whatever you want to call it. You know? Yeah, how long did it take you to write that song? Well, you know, twenty years and three minutes. That's right, twenty years and three minutes. All right. <laughs> So it's all about that. And, and, you know, again, with Bailey, like all the work that we did initially with her on social media got us the breaks that we got to um, to um, to move forward in, with the networks, mm-hmm. with Heartland Network, getting the exclusive broadcast there and moving the needle on their social media because our social media was so strong that we went right into medium. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like. The work that you do now, right now, people, is is if, if you're waiting just to meet the big guy that's going to press the easy button and make it work for you, you're screwed. Yeah, I'm telling you that right now. It's not about that. It's about consistency. It's about what you do every day. It's about starting that spark and all this stuff that Brent and I talked about today, and we talk about every day on this podcast. Frankly, you can be doing from your laptop. You know, from your house with no, not paying anybody to do it. You can learn about it and figure out how to do it. But understand that it's not going to be, it's not going to catch fire on YouTube by itself. It's not going to get on the radio by itself. And, and no big industry executive is going to make that happen for you either, by the way, because mm-hmm. that's out of their control. It really isn't. Like you have to start that fire. You've got to at least have a campfire going. Right. Hopefully. A bit of a bonfire on your way to a bonfire and the record label comes in and turns that with, you know, helicopters full of gasoline into a forest fire. Right. Right. That's where they're at now. They used to start the campfire, Mm -hmm. but they don't start the campfire anymore. So partly because they don't have to, because there's some other artists that you're competing against for that slot on that record label that has done the work and they are talented and they have the other Mm -hmm. stuff, too. And if it comes down between you and them and they already are doing this stuff. That you're not doing because you want it to be all organic, but they're out there hustling and and working it. More likely, they're going to get the one. They're going to get the record deal. Yeah, and and, and let's let's wrap up this one point. You know, you just you just made me think of this. So it's you still got to hustle, okay? You still got to make sure that you can do whatever you can do to get your music in front of people that are predisposed to liking your kind of music. That part is intentional. Okay. The organic part, if you're a good songwriter, if you're a good band, if you're a good artist and you're really in your game and you're doing your work, the organic part happens after cri- critical mass, mm-hmm. you know, because then it's again, it's like there's so many people going to this tent. Why are these people going to the tent? Why is there a line around that tent? I want to see what's going on there. You wait in line, you get in and it's like, holy crap, there's Elvis, mm-hmm. right? And now you're a believer in Elvis, too, because you just invested two hours waiting in line to find out what the heck was going on in the tent. Right. And then you figured it out. And now it means more to you. You know, so it's about it. it, 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 it it's the organic part is there once. But but, it, it, you know, the 
it doesn't start the fire. Right. You know, it, you've got to start the fire and then it'll organically grow once it's started. But you need to get a good fire going. And I mean, if you live in the South, nothing attracts a crowd like a good bonfire mm-hmm. and a couple of bottles of shine. Right. <laughs> and I mean, people you don't even know will show up. Exactly. You know? <laughs> So when you're in the right place at the right time, I mean, I remember when we first moved down to Florida to work with Bud and the Almond Brothers, he's like, welcome to Florida. All your friends are going to show up. We're like, what are you talking about? Sure enough, the next week, every one of our friends that we hardly ever talked to, like distant friends we hadn't talked to in years are like, dude, I'm, I'm coming down to visit, you know, and because like, they knew they could stay in the cats for free. And All right. <laughs> we were the most popular dudes for like two years from friends we forgot we even had in Wisconsin. It had nothing to do with the music. It had everything to do with the sunshine, yes. you know, but it's. But it's just about that, guys. You got to start the fire. So, with that, um, this wraps up another episode of um, the, climb. the climb. And so, John, I'm not done. I'm saying you're not done, are you? Do you have something you're giving away? I got I got two things I want to talk things. about. One thing okay. I'm giving away. One thing. One thing I'm not. But but it it, it it's good. So as always, uh, the, the gift from johnny.com it's a best-selling book on twitter that demystifies twitter gives you the basic ins and outs as a tour through the app and shows you how you can target and connect with an audience that's going to like you okay and grow your real fan base by at least a thousand accounts every single month and just work in 15 minutes a day that's a pretty good deal it costs just go to gift from johnny j-o-h-n-n-y.com secondly uh, man, we've been really doing just a lot more consulting lately, you mm-hmm. know, uh, people calling up and, uh, we, you know, we do charge for that and, uh, you know, you know, hit, hit me up at info at daredevilproduction.com. Again, production is singular. There's no S info at daredevilproduction.com, but I will take a look at everything you've got going on, uh, on your web store, on your website, on your social media. And, and it, you'd be amazed at what we can accomplish in one hour. Okay. Mm-hmm. And. And, and tell you how, you know, just give you some different goals that you can work on to get you on the right path. So you're asking the right questions mm-hmm. on what you need to do to improve. So there cool. you have it, my man. Awesome. So, yeah, y'all definitely check it out. I pick Johnny's brain a lot. Unfortunately, I don't actually do everything he tells me to do. So therefore, my numbers reflect that. <laughs> but it's a good advice. I'm just busy. Dang it. Uh, <laughs> but, yeah, definitely recommend y'all give Johnny a shout and check it out. It's good stuff. He's getting results. So. Yeah, good one. All right, well, y'all keep on climbing. All right, see you at the top.